Good evening, esteemed members of City Council. My name is Jim Hill. I serve the City in the Department of Community Development, and I serve as the Secretary to the Commission of Architectural Review. My main role here this evening is to set out some of the, uh, the timeline and describe the process and various actions taken, and answer any questions you have about process before the um, members of the Commission will speak to you about their decision. The Oakwood Heights development proposed 33 units on parcels zoned R53 for multifamily. The Shimbarazo Park Old Historic District is characterized by single family houses. The Commission of Architectural Review from the beginning of their review of this proposal recognized and acknowledged the underlying zoning and took great care to, um, in their review, to consider matters uh, that were authorized by the city code for their review without running afoul of um, the underlying by right um, zoning. The commission, from the standards for new construction in the city code, the Commission of Architectural Review shall approve new construction which it deems to be compatible with the design scale, materials, color, height, setback, and other pertinent features of the old historic district in which it is located. Uh, this was, I believe, the third um, iteration of the project on this site. And uh, this, the current design was first um, submitted to staff on, in July of 2008. Staff conducted a review applying the guidelines in the old historic district handbook and design review guidelines uh, that are adopted by the commission. And in its staff report to the commission recommended approval. At the CAR meeting of August 26, 2008, the commission voted to defer the application. They had identified a number of issues that were of concern to them, and they deferred the vote um, and asked the applicant to revise the plans to address those issues that they had identified and to come back to subsequent meeting for another review. In October, end of October 2008, staff received a revised application, conducted a review under the guidelines, and in our staff report recommended approval. At the November 25, 2008 commission meeting, after um, lengthy deliberation and a number of other um, opportunities for discussion with both the community and the applicant. Um, the commission voted to, to deny the application, finding that the massing of the proposed construction was incompatible with that of the existing Shimbrazo Park Old Historic District. Basis from the guidelines for their decision are Secretary of Interior Standards Rehabilitation Standard 9. Um, for new additions, for new construction, shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have about the process. The question to you, Mr. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Jerome. Uh, just with what you read, uh, it, do I understand uh, correctly that in July of 08, in October of 08, um, uh, though you may have asked for additional um, revising, it looks like you're saying that you approved, the commission approved the project twice? The commission did not vote to approve the project. Staff prepares a recommendation in the form of a staff report after its review. Staff um, does an objective application, uh, um, objective review using the, um, the guidelines. I'm sorry, I need to make that distinction. Yes. Staff recommended. Staff recommendation. Right. And then the commission, um, again, in their objective application, the guidelines uh, did not with the staff recommendation. 
There are questions. No, I, I assume now because the lesson will do that. Just like for some reason, now it is an asking for a question. Um, can you give me an idea how long after the most recent site plan was submitted did the issue of masking, uh, how, how long after the initial, the most recent site plan was presented was the issue of incompatible masking brought up? Well, was it, it was not, um, it did not occur in the staff report because the staff did not note that as an incompatibility. But at the November 25th meeting, certainly it came up as part of the discussion. And the most recent site plan was presented on October 31st? Yes, what happens is um, there's a deadline prior to the meeting to give staff the opportunity to review the application, prepare the materials, and do public notice, that sort of thing. And then we um, write our staff report and distribute that with the application to the commission um, several days in advance of the meeting. So um, they've seen various versions of this plan. Uh, I would say between July 25th and November 25th. Thank you. Ms. Chatham, and Madam President. Um, so you were saying that the staff did not approve it at first and then they turned around and they did approve it. Um, what kind of compromise did you all come up with? Because it seems like tonight it's kind of like it's still not the issues are still not solved as of tonight. Well, I'll try to set the record straight. Staff does not approve anything. Staff makes a, uh, formulates a recommendation that goes to the commission. It doesn't bind the commission in any way. It's, it's a guide. Staff's review and report serves as a guide for their discussion or spring report for their discussion. Um, any number of times in the course of the year, um, the commission will set aside its staff's recommendation and vote, uh, take a different action. So it's, it's not so much, uh, and, and also because, I would like to add that because staff does not advocate or oppose projects, but only makes this objective application of the standards, um, when, the, when the commission makes a decision, when they take their vote as staff to the commission, and staff supports the decision of the commission. Any more questions? I, I have one question. In August, when this project was brought before you, the commission deferred the application. Um, you agree that eight conditions needed to be met by the applicant. Is that correct? The members of the commission would be very specific in pointing out that they termed them issues to be addressed. Okay. Staff had been referring to them as conditions, but um, at no time did the commission um, formulate a conditional approval. So the, but, the, but the commission identified eight issues. In the course of the August meeting, there were um, eight issues, and then a ninth one that came up. There were eight issues identified in the staff's report and a ninth one came out in the course of discussion. And then in the November meeting, those eight, it looked to me in minutes, those eight issues had been addressed by the developer, and then a ninth issue or tenth issue, the massing at the November meeting was brought up. Is that correct? Um, it definitely, the massing was part of the, was part of the November discussion, discussion, the November meeting. But not part of the August discussion. I would, I would need to check the, the minutes to see. It's not the minutes. Minutes. Okay, but it was not, um, it was not at that time one of those eight or nine issues. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to ask a question about where in the section does massing, the word massing, the, is, where's, where's your massing used in the zoning ordinance in the city first? In the old and historic, when 
when I look at the zoning ordinance here, is there any words that refer back to massing? I see height, I see certain other things, but I don't see the word massing. Where does the word massing come into play? The word massing does not appear in the standards for new construction. That, that refers to design, scale, materials, color, height, setback, and other pertinent features. Um, the, the commission is authorized to adopt additional standards, and that the word massing comes into play. Um, it's found in the National Park Service's Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, which are 10 standards that are um, widely adopted as the national standard for, for preservation and uh, are the, a, a foundation for the design review guidelines for the city's own historic districts. And that's where the language um, shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. Follow up. Has the CAR formally adopted these standards? Yes, they, they occur in the um, City Old Historic District Handbook and Design Review Guidelines. Okay, so then under their CAR committee, they basically adopted those rules? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hey, may I ask one Rules or guidelines, which did you say? Um, these, are, these are the Design Review Guidelines. Okay, thank you. Ms. Gallen, Madam President, so we do not have to vote on any of what's in those guidelines? Council has, you don't have any say so what's, what's in that book? Um, I would, I would imagine that they would dialogue with you about that, but they, the commission itself is authorized to adopt the additional guidelines um, to augment those things that are in the city code. And does Follow oh, on that. It's my understanding that what's in the code, there are some of those guidelines are controlling law for car review, but also the guidelines are not controlling an advisory only. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Probably at this time it would be appropriate to have car, rent a car, members of car. And I, I would say that um, you know, the car vote was the car vote was four to two, correct? That's correct. Okay. Also wanted your forgiveness on the opportunity to state that in addition to the word massing appearing in the secretary standards, it also appears um, in, the, in the guidelines for new construction. There's a section that addresses massing. So massing is in the guidelines and also in the national guidelines that were adopted by CAR, correct? Yes, and all, all present in the, in the handbook. Okay. Historic and architectural character 
of all in historic districts. And these historic districts created to provide a means by which city council may recognize and protect historic, architectural, cultural, artistic heritage of this city. This process is a part of the promotion of general welfare and protection of neighborhoods identified as old and historic neighborhoods. We have gone by the law. We have spent time with the applicant. The bottom line was, unfortunately, the design that was presented to us, and that is all we are. We are a design overlay commission. We never use the Z word. We never use the B word. They are not in our ordinance, and trust me, they are not in our guidelines. We, if you've read our minutes, you will see the only times they're mentioned is when people on the commission have said, we are blind to that, and we are. We promote development, we have worked with developers, we want to see good development. Our charge, though, is we must follow the law. We have sworn an oath to the council of the city of Richmond to go by the law. Now, we personally may like other things, but that's not what we raised our hand to. We go by our guidelines, and we have worked unbelievable hours to make them user-friendly and to make them correct. But, again, by Article Section 930, something, something, parentheses H, we, the City of Richmond, had car adapt the guidelines that we have adapted. We have to go by them. And this particular design project, as we were given in November, after working with them, for months and two additional work sessions did not meet the criteria of the guidelines, nor did it meet the laws of this city that we are sworn to uphold. This decision that you will make tonight affects not just a little neighborhood around the corner, but there are over 4,000 property owners who live in old and historic districts who for over 50 years have gone through the process that we have in CAR. I'm not even going to tell you the millions of dollars that have come on board for this city with our historic resources and our historic neighborhood. I'm not even going into the fact that some of these neighborhoods have really been brought up from almost the dead. But as a member of CAR, I'm here to tell you, and I was there at the meetings, at the work sessions, and until quarter of ten that night with only one potty break, we followed the law. And we also followed your guidelines that we have. The guidelines that we have under the law. And this is not just the city of Richmond. This was given to Richmond by the state of Virginia. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Thank you. Yes. Mr. Joe. I, uh, I respect what you do. Uh, we need you to do what you do. From my understanding, that you get at least in the area of 25 of these applications. Yes, sir. A month. Month. A month. And that is not counting the time that staff puts in with the citizens in helping them before they even get to us. They may not even need to get to us because staff can approve a lot of things for, for the citizens in the Olmos Square districts. What, what, what's amazing is what moves me to even speak because I said I don't want to speak on this paper tonight <laughs> is when we talk about massive and car approves four story buildings and provided historic tax credit we talk about massive. This is in St. John's Old Historic District. That's massive. That's massive. Approved. Our car. We talk about massive. We talk about Shaco Bottom 
find in the spirit. Um, it suggests, here's another, this is a project of Shaq Obama. Listen. And so, obviously, there have been exceptions made with regards to that. And so, yes, we do. We rely on you to use your judgment and your laws and guidelines. It's pretty obvious that there have been exceptions. Uh, and it just seems, my question to you is, uh, um, given that everything else is sort of worked out, is, is massing the only outstanding issue with this project? In all due respect, Mr. Gore. Yes, ma'am. I'm not 100% sure every picture she showed me was even in a little historic neighborhood in there. And number two, massing is important in any neighborhood if it does not fit within the particulars of that unique old and historic neighborhood. I'm not saying every decision that Carr has ever made was 100% right, but I am saying this one is.
Oprah was not compatible. And you mentioned Manson, and before, and I, well, I shouldn't say this, and I got paid, so I tend to be the one that closes the door and turns off the light when I leave. But we tried to discuss, I tried to discuss Manson with him. And I was told, and this was like September, I was told I'm not going to talk about it. Go right to the council. So we then. Sorry, I didn't hear that. I was told by the applicant that they okay. didn't want to talk about it. We are there to facilitate as much as we can and to be available as much as we can to the applicant to come to a successful, a successful project. Because that's what we want. This particular design, when it was presented to us in November, was not finished and it was not compatible by the law and by our guidelines. Carrie, good. Are there any more questions? Any more questions? I have one question. One more question. <laughs> Sorry. When you, when we talk about an historic district, yes, and you talk about what is compatible, are you talking about what is compatible in that district or what is compatible on that block? Because the district has a lot of massive buildings in it. That historic district. In the immediate area, but it doesn't have to be just the block. But in the immediate area. Like two blocks away? Well, that, that impacts that area. Uh, it is the unique, again, as the ordinance says, the unique character of the neighborhood. What makes that neighborhood worthy of being put into, and that's another whole set, which it meant, being put into the category of an old historic it, that's what I'm trying to figure out. When you and a project comes to you, do you look at what is in that entire historic district or what is on the block? Because clear, I, this, this is big for that block, but it's not big for a block and a half away. I would have to say I look at what is around that area. I will not go necessarily to the far end of a neighborhood to say, oh yes, over here, blah, blah, blah. But what makes that area its character? So then the, those two blocks would be what you consider that neighborhood. Right. But, but yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you know, thanks for all you do, too. We really appreciate your work. We do. We do. <laughs> You are for all set. We're going to give you. Yes. We're not going to give you that so much time. How much time do you need? Uh, less than two minutes. Okay, you got it. Um, good evening. My name is Mimi Sagar. I serve as vice chair of the commission. I'm a historical architect who works with property owners who seek to comply with the Secretary of the Interior's standards, the basis for our guidelines. Um, here, we see an aerial photograph of the block in question where the Oakwood Heights project is planned. As you can see, the existing buildings are small scale, two-story masses whose most important features are their cornices and their one-story porches. Like much of Richmond, the block is penetrated by a public alley, which is part of what we consider when we look at the impacts of the project. Members of City Council, the proposed new construction is not compatible with the character of the Chimborazo Park Old and Historic District. The design of the proposed buildings as experienced from the new north-south roadways that you see sketched on this aerial photograph and from within the block at the end of the public alley is not compatible with the scale, massing, and character of the rest of the district, particularly the part of the district here in this block. Here we see one of those elevations that faces into the block that you would see from the alley and from those two new roadways that enter from Marshall and Broad. You're seeing here the north end of the project as it faces the alley. You see the Marshall Street side on the left. Um, we do not question the design of the blocks as they front Marshall or East Broad. 
The applicant has worked very carefully and we believe she's developed a compatible design for those two fronts. But the interior of the block is too massive and has a character we believe is not compatible with this district of small individual houses with one-story front porches. We do not question the applicant's proposed use of the property or the density of the design. Along with most commission members, I attended the work sessions. The owner came a long way. She revised the project design in response to our suggestions. And as a result, portions of this project are compatible and other portions still are not. We ask that you uphold the commission's denial so that we can continue working with the applicant to develop a project that will be compatible with its historic neighborhood. Thank you very much. Any Thank questions? you very much. Any questions? Okay. Questions? All right, this is the uh, third public hearing on this. It's going to planning, it's going to land use, and now it's in front of city council. So at this time, I'm going to ask the proponents for this project, the people who want this project to go forward, the folks who want us to reverse the decision of CAR. You'll get 15 minutes. Okay, sorry. Right. Go. Go. Madam President, members of the council, Andy Thomas and William Tolan here on behalf of Margaret Coyne and her company. Uh, we would, if at all possible, like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. We didn't talk about that. We thought we were going second. I'll leave that to your discretion. Uh, I have seen correspondence uh, through give and take in between the Animal Agents Committee asking about was this conceptual or was this an actual uh, request for a certificate of appropriateness. I will point out three things. Our application was for a certificate of appropriateness. The minutes, if you look at them, the denial was denial of a certificate of appropriateness, and the letter from the staff says your certificate of appropriateness is denied. This was not a conceptual review. I think this is properly before the city council. I'm going to waste any more time on that issue unless you want me to talk about it, or if it's presented by the opposition, I'll be happy to talk about it. We have every right to be here in front of city council per the appeal by city code. Since 2007, we've been working with CAR. We've had a lot of discussion about what happened in August and October 2008. We've been working since 2007. We've been working with the city since 2005 to help design a project, and we finally brought it before CAR in November of 2007. We've been recommended for approval by staff three times, the last time unconditionally. We've been denied three times by CAR. You will hear tonight, they bought the property, they knew what the guidelines were, they've got to be able to abide by the guidelines, like everybody else. They just think the guidelines don't apply to them. I agree that we have to abide by the guidelines. This is not a situation we are asking for a variance from the guidelines. We have the right to build on this lot 33 units per the R53 zoning code, and we meet the guidelines, and we meet the code. We do all those things. We're not asking for a variance. We're not asking to be treated differently. We do meet the guidelines. Ask the staff three times. Last time unconditionally, they recommended approval that we met the guidelines. Ask the two members of CAR that recommended and made a motion to approve that we met the guidelines. Ask us. Photos from Fulton Hill property projects are in the guidelines as examples. We know how to do the guidelines. I presented to the council a long list, guidelines step by step, and accounting of how we meet the guidelines. Going to some of the questions that were brought up, what controls? The code controls. The guidelines are solely that. The code says CAR may pass guidelines. They don't have to, but they may. Is that binding on the, on the, uh, on the CAR? I don't know. The code says shall. The guidelines, they should do this. I'm going to make a couple of quotes in there. They talk about should. Recommended that. When we're talking about the code that you're bound by, you're not bound by the guidelines in my opinion, you're bound by the code. Is it compatible to the district? Not to the neighborhood, not to a two-block district, to the district itself. CAR, with all due respect, even with the best intentions, just might. And it is possible, just might get it wrong. Just maybe. Just maybe. I'll actually present to you the adjacent home. I've shown this picture to just about everybody. I call it the blue house next door. That's the mass that we're incompatible with. A long blue wall with no windows. The code requires that there be an error by car. 
We believe that there was an error. We went ahead and appealed in my letter of appeal. We said that there was an error. I'll give you two examples. Talk about size, mass, and scale. When asked the Land Use Committee just even this evening, they said they meet it on Broad and Marshall Streets. During the process we went through car, they said pull it back from the rear. We want the buildings to be able to have sustainable development. We want the road and the parking moved back from the rear of the site along the bluff. We want the building moved away from the streets in the lower height along Broad and Marshall. Well, guess what? When you got 33 units, on-site parking and open space, there's only one place left. The center of the site where the alley is, which was denied to be closed, so we have to keep that open as well. We have to work around that. And we have to keep the house. We've worked around all of those things to be able to provide an allowance for the guidelines as recommended. The guidelines also talk about what is massing. That was one of the questions tonight. Does it mention the guidelines? Sure it does. It says, typical massing patterns throughout the city and historic districts are simple and block-like. Therefore, new structures should, should avoid the use of staggered setbacks, towers, or elaborate balconies. That's what massing is according to the guidelines. Thank you very much. I think that pretty much says it all. That as long as we can avoid those things, then we're meeting the should of the guidelines. The guidelines also talk about human scale along the street. Not about the alley, not about the private streets, but the street. Human scale. So we have two stories along Broad and Marshall with a step back at three, and when the property finally dips down to a 50-foot cliff, then we add a basement level for four stories. Let's bring this to the second example. Let me read you a quote from the minutes, and it was actually mentioned a little bit tonight, too. The quote from the minutes that Ms. White stated that four-story buildings are twice the height of two-story buildings in the neighborhood, and that would be huge. The neighborhood is not the question. The Sumerazo Park District is the question. By the neighbor's own memo from their attorney, Mr. Thorson, he said the average height is 36.2 feet in this block. 36.2 feet. That's great, but you know what? We're limited by code to 35 feet in height. We've got to be below the average of 36.2 anyway, by the very definition of the height district with which we will comply. So we're not, it's not a question of too tall, it's not a question of too big, it's a question, and our, our point of view is that if you boil it down to its basic element, it's a question of the actual density. Within the uh, Chivarazzo Park District, over 50% of the homes over 50% of the homes in this district are greater than three stories. There are three, four, or six stories in this district, more than 50%. Massing is really concerned with density. And how can we fit in that density when we squeeze everything to the center? We're trying to avoid a cookie cutter approach. We're trying to be good stewards for both the environment and the neighborhood. We have to be contemporary. I know a number of you have looked at that and said, it's not what I would approve, but the guidelines say contemporary, we work with the staff. By right, we can build 33 units. We're meeting the law of the code. That's what the car has to do, and that's what we're doing. The guidelines are suggestions, and the guidelines do not supersede the code requirements. We have the right to build 33 units. We have the right to build up to 35 feet height. Car should have approved it as recommended by staff unconditionally to allow the proposed development. To do otherwise was an error, and that's what we're asking you to overturn. Is that error from car? Now I'd like to turn it over to Margaret Cronin. We'd like to speak a little bit, and we have some other supporters that would like to speak as well. We have any questions as well. <coughs> Madam President, Honorable Members of Council, my name is Margaret Freud, and I'm the owner of Fulton Hill Properties. Tonight, I'm asking you to grant relief and approve our Oakwood Heights project. I appreciate the fair and thoughtful review we received by the Council Land Use Committee. Councilwoman Robertson asked Ms. Sadler why did she think the Commission would come to such a different conclusion than the recommendation of staff. Ms. Sadler's response was, well, the staff spends a lot of time carefully reviewing the submission of the applicant. But new information can be presented at the hearing. We have provided evidence that a three-dimensional rendering presented to CAR by Mr. Fairlam on behalf of the Neighbors for Compatible Development contained numerous gross inaccuracies that misrepresented our project. Staff did not review, and we were never allowed to rebut these renderings. This isn't right. This is unfair. As stated in the guidelines, the purpose of CAR is to facilitate the approval of applications. Facilitate the approval of applications. Councilwoman 
Graziano, you saw us at the Planning Commission when we tried to close the alley. That was 2005, facilitating the approval. Members of council may wonder why Carver pushed the design and redesigned so much, attending frequent work sessions and still denying. The zoning for this exact density has been in place at least 90 years. We didn't ask to have it changed. Carver's not authorized to change the zoning. In 2005, we proffered land to the city with a request to close a portion of the adjacent alley. This would have reduced the density. The alley closing was denied after some neighbors, including Jean White, who sits on car, opposed it. Density is the very definition of a city. <clears throat> density is essential to having a city that is vibrant. Federal funding is based on density. $2,200 per person for the current census. This district needs those services. Benefits of density include tax revenue, better schools, support for small business, and mass transit. Cities need density. Appropriate massing will be different for different uses. Those opposed to us talk a lot about two-story houses. In fact, the house across the street at 3627 to 3629 Broad, yes, it's a duplex, is two stories on the street, and it's three stories in the back where the land falls away. This is the exact approach we've taken in adding height to the structures on the interior where our land slopes downhill. It's clear that there will be more mass to a multi-family building than there will be for a single-family building or a duplex. Think about a school that's right next to houses. The mass is bigger. It's a different use. This denial is an attempt to strip away the property rights, my property rights, that allow this density. Carl's denial is not just in error, it's just plain wrong. As staff has written, the primary elevations are those on Marshall and Broad Streets. Even Ms. Sadler admitted at the Council Land Use Committee, and today, that we have met the guidelines on Marshall and Broad Street. The alley view and the view from the driveways, which in effect become new alleys, are secondary. The Secretary of the Interior Standards, on which these guidelines are based, point out that the view to be considered is the view from the street, not the view from the alley or the second floor of any nearby structures. And we are very familiar with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Photos of our projects are used as examples of compliance in the published handbook containing these guidelines. And those photographs, rep photographs represent projects that have all been approved by the Secretary of the Interior based on the Secretary of the Interior Standards. This demonstrates that we have successfully met these guidelines in the past. This project will be the first fully sustainable multifamily project in the city. We hope it will attract residents of all ages, as it will be accessible to residents of all abilities. This project will create jobs, generate $115,000 or more a year in taxes, approximately $250,000 in fees to the city, and bring life to a depressed area overlooking what was recently a trailer park between two dead end streets. We also believe the sort of people that have expressed interest in these homes will become wonderful new neighbors. Through this process, we've met many who share our vision of sustainability and density as positive urban properties. To those folks who have shown courage to support us in the face of harsh treatment from those who oppose this project, I am truly thankful. Former Councilwoman McQuinn attended meetings with the neighbors opposed to this project and spent years helping us search for common ground with them. She has provided a letter on behalf of this project and agrees with staff that we have met the guidelines. I am most grateful to Dele Delegate McQuinn for her support and her integrity. She demanded from us a willingness to address all reasonable requests from Carr and the neighbors that opposed us and has now stood up to these neighbors as they failed to respond in good faith. I have a long history of investing in the city in areas where development is riskiest. I ask you to approve our project so we can develop in this area as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rebecca Aaron Sidner. I'm a resident of Church Hill, I live in the 2500 block of uh, 25th and Broad. Uh, I'm also a green building consultant within a firm that does lead consulting for right now about 150 projects in Virginia, DC, and Maryland. 
Um, I'm here today as a private citizen. I'm not involved in the project at all. Uh, but I firmly believe that this is the kind of project that this city needs. Um, historic preservation is and has been very important to me. My husband and I uh, lived in and uh, renovated two houses on Broad Street in Churchill before moving up further up the hill and buying a commercial building and renovating that to historic standards, which Mimi Sadler helped us with. Uh, preservation is important, and we, it is, we do need to do it, but it needs to be compatible. This project does not detract from the historic neighborhood. Uh, density supports neighborhood businesses. We have a lot of successful businesses in Churchill. The more density we have, the better. Density promotes walkability, which if you live in Churchill, it's a pretty nice place to walk around. Promotes safety with more eyes on the street. Promotes community interaction. And one, density is relative. Um, scale and form is, are, are crucial, and I believe that this development addresses that. Um, this development is what the master plan is looking for. It's sympathetic to its neighbors, and I think one thing to point out is that compatible is a word that can have many interpretations. Compatible should not mean identical. It should mean sympathetic, and I believe this project is. It also incorporates green building, which is something that the master plan calls for. It also adds residents and tax base. Also, I want to point out that green building on multifamily projects is much harder than green building on conventional commercial projects. When you're looking at lease certification, basic lease certification for multifamily is about equal to silver on a commercial project because of the situation situations involved with multifamily. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Please begin to summarize. Okay. Um, it addresses stormwater, which is important to the city and our combined sewer issues. It, it puts people closer to public transportation, which means less vehicle miles driven, which means less pollution. And this developer is volunteering to do this. This is not something that anyone had to convince them to do. And again, this is the kind of development and the type of developers that I think this city needs. I strongly urge the city to embrace the and embrace right. this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know, Mr. Conlon, you have some more people that want to speak, but if they could just stand. Yeah, I think perfect. we'll do is block anybody that's in support. Please stand. You have both sides, huh? All right, thank you very much. We're going to give about 15 minutes to those who want to confirm the decision of CAR and do not want to see this project move forward in its present state. No. And, uh, all right, it's at the clock to go. Mr. President, Mr. Crock, good afternoon or good evening. My name is James Thorson. and I'm counsel for the neighborhoods for, uh, the neighbors for compatible development. And I want to bring to you uh, the code of the city of Richmond, which sets forth the uh, Commission for Architectural Review. The purpose of the uh, CAR is to preserve the unique and architectural character of each district through the review and application of certificates of appropriateness. Here, the Commission of Architecture Review has been in business for 50 years. Those 50 years preserve the history and character of the unique neighborhoods. In this case, the old uh, uh, Chimborazo uh, District, which uh, became a historic district in 1987. The duties and responsibilities of the Commission of Architecture Review this it's a question that's been raised here, shall have the duty to adopt architectural standards, architectural standards applicable to properties located in, in old and historic districts, adopt guidelines for the delegation uh, for the uh, delegation to the secretary of the review, and approve applications for certificate of appropriateness. So it's the duty of the CAR to adopt guidelines, and they've done that, and that's pursuant to City Code 114. 930.3D1, uh, 6, and 7. The reason I'm laying this, this uh, out for you because the city's own code sets the standards for new construction in the historic district. Those standards of uh, CAR in the historic district are 
to be viewed together with any zoning regulations. So we're not here today talking about their rights to zoning. It's the rights that they have in zoning that must be compatible with the rights of uh, the Commission for Architecture Review and the Code of the City of Richmond. I put together a five-page memo for each of the co Commission members to, re to read and Squire, that particularly this is important to you because this is your district. This is an important decision. The memo I pointed out talks about the combat compatibility of the project of the block it's going on. That's part of the guidelines. This block is single-family homes. And in my memo, I made a uh, uh, notation on page 5 of 36.2 uh, feet. That was an error, and uh, we'll have other people talk about the appropriate height of those single-family two-story homes, which are more along the lines of 25 to 28 feet. But in any case, when you look at my memo, it talks about the form, relationship of the new construction in terms of form, scale, and height, width, and massing. Massing is an issue. It's in the guidelines, and uh, when you read the guidelines together, look at the decision of the uh, Commission of Architecture Review at the uh, November 25, 2008 meeting when it voted twice. Once on the conceptual approval of the project, which was denied uh, 4 to 2, and on the uh, certificate of appropriateness, which was denied 4 to 2. If you look at the developer's application, the last set of applications, October 31st, 2008 letter, the developer is asking for approval. It's conceptual approval only, not asking for a certificate of appropriateness. But in any case, there is no error, and the commission uh, decision should be approved because there is no error in its ruling that this council should overturn. Uh, with that, I ask, urge you to read the memo, and to the extent that the Commission um, Council grants any rebuttal time to uh, uh, Council for the developer, we would like the sufficient sir rebuttal time to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Mastine Braswell. I'm a resident of 3627 East Road. I've been there for 51 years. Um, I heard the developer said that we had three store houses, we don't. The basement center of houses are not even counting the tax records, and then I know this is my sister, she lives next door. And we are here to support car because if you go back to all the maps over here to kids, everything on that block was a two story residential houses, sidewalks, front yards, and all of the neighborhood amenities that we were looking for. And I think that this type of cluster building would not. Thank you for listening. I just want to remind you, you guys have, have 15 minutes and you've used up four and a half. So talk fast if you don't want to get through. Hi. I'm Bo Farrell. I'm a for, former resident of the 3600 block of East Broad. I bought my house at 3608 and a half East Broad in 1982. Lived on it and lived in the block for over 23 years. Um, I'm a licensed architect in the state of Virginia. I'm here today in support of my neighbors on the block, historic districts of Richmond, the Commission of Architectural Review, and the process created by the ordinance to ensure that new construction in historic districts is compatible. Section 114, 930.7 standards and guidelines states in paragraph C, standards for new construction. The Commission of Architectural Review shall review and approve new construction which it deems to be compatible with the design, scale, materials, colors, height, setback, and other pertinent features of all the historic districts in which it's located. The Commission may adopt new standards for the review certificate of purposes to supplement these standards. These standards are clearly documented in the old and historic district handbook and as it has been noted, very clearly speaks to massing on this page. It's very much part of the design, the guidelines, and also I'd like to mention to you, it speaks, it says, the new structures shall have the same number of stories as the majority of structures on the block. On the block. And Ms. Freud's own material, she provides pictures of, of the houses on the block. Every one of these houses is a two-story two -story structure. That's 100%. That's, that's a pretty super majority. Um, Let's talk about massing. Let me be clear. Massing speaks to the size of the building. Excuse me one second. Just remember, look at the line. I'm yeah. trying to, okay. try to make okay. it clear. It speaks right. to the size of the building relative to the footprint. 
This is my former house at 3608 and a half East Broad. It's a 25 foot tall building. Okay? These, when you put them together, are four story masses that stretch from Marshall Street to Broad Street. These are, this is a model built with using Ms. Freud's drawings and they show the relationship. These are four story heights right here. And that's what the neighborhood is concerned about. These are not compatible with, and they don't, do not meet standards. It's not compatible with the published standard, published standards of, of the city and the commission has found as clearly stated his decision to deny this application. What was proposed did not meet the guidelines respect the masking scale and was required by the ordinance to be compatible. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> President Grazio and members of City Council. I'm David Herring, I'm the uh, director of the Alliance to Conserve All Personal Neighborhoods. I've been paying attention to this issue for more than a year, and I can't help but come to always be brought back to the fact that this project cannot satisfy the most basic element established by the guidelines uh, of the CAR. The issue of height, width, proportion, and massing is found on page 43 of the guidelines. In this particular matter, I must convey to you my strongest support for the Commission of Architecture Review and the neighbors in the block which will be directly impacted if this project is allowed to proceed. Let me elaborate on my concerns for this matter. First, the St. John's Church District was the first district to be established. There are now 15 districts in the city. Union Hill is currently proceeding through the application process. They recognize the advantages of a city open historic district and want to join the ranks of the other 15 areas currently designated, despite occasional this, this current proposal. That is not to say it cannot be resolved, but not within the current proposed development. Third, neighbors directly affected by this proposed development have placed their trust in CAR and worked diligently for more than two years with the Commission to resolve this issue. Residents also trusted the developer to work within the, the established guidelines. Unfortunately, this, tru this trust was breached by refusing to comply with the concept of messing clearly established in the guidelines. While this applicant is entitled to her appeal before you, it is important to note that the neighbors are trusting you with their homes and lives and are requesting that you uphold the decision of the CAR. These people will be directly affected by the construction of this project that has been deemed inappropriate in massing by the CAR, the entity that City Council, can trust, City Council trusts to make the correct decisions. This is not a matter of zoning by right or taste. This is a clear-cut issue where the Commission members deny the Oakwood Heights proposal on the fundamental flaw that has existed from the beginning. The massing of the project simply does not comply with the guidelines set forth by the City Oakland Historic District Guideline, a zoning overlay district as part of the City Charter. I trust you will thoroughly and thoughtfully deliberate this issue, relying on the expertise of the Commission that was appointed by you. On Friday, I was at home. There was a stack of papers dropped in my lap. They were petitions to the city council. I don't appreciate the council going through those papers because none of those people lived in that area. They lived all the way over the other side of town or below Q Street in the province going down to Bungalow City. And that's not fair to the people that live in the area. And if you're going against us on the papers, I'm sorry, but it's not fair to the residents. My name is Deanna Lewis. I'm restoring a house at 314 North 36th Street. I'm a, uh, a new builder in the area. And I see Carr as a guardian of the historic district. And the historic guidelines, building codes, and zoning codes are put there for a reason. I can build a foundation. It has to be a certain thickness, a certain height. Otherwise, the building is going to fall down. I have to abide by zoning. That building has to be a certain height. Give enough room for fire and emergency services to move around and protect those citizens. And now we have a historic district. And we've got those rules in place to protect the fabric of a neighborhood. What I want to do here, and um, Coach Jewel, I'm sorry, not Coach Jewel, Coach Dempsey stole my line, 
is, I intend to make this place better for the next 100 years. What you decide tonight is going to determine the fabric of that particular block in that neighborhood for the next 100 years. And Councilman Squire, it was a pleasure to meet you this weekend. And you see, we have the neighbors here, and this is our neighborhood. This is the fabric of our neighborhood. I vote to uphold Carr's decision, and I would hope that the council would do the same. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is John Johnson. I'm the president of Churchill Association, now having 280 members, the old ones and the new ones. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that the folks that live in the community, that walk their dogs, that have their children in strollers, that jog up and down the road, that walk, have picnics, live, eat, sleep, die in that community, as a community, have voted this to be not compatible. The folks that live there, look around when this was presented. They brought their drawings, they brought their concepts to our meetings. Their bottom line was, this is the way it is, we ain't listening to you. In any other words, they were inflexible. We made suggestions, we were blown off. The folks who live there don't like the drawings and don't like the massive scale, whatever you want to call it. Yes, she has the right, according to the law, according to this, all those other rats and tats. But just because you have the right, does that mean you should? Does that mean that you should? It means that you apply common sense and respect for your neighborhood and the people that live in it. 280 folks in her community say no. Please agree with them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Hughes, and I brought the property on East Marshall Street right adjacent to this site in August of 2007. I knew the property would be developed, but I felt comfortable buying here because we have a historic district ordinance that I thought would ensure that what was built next to my house would be compatible with the historic district and with my block. So I felt comfortable making You have 30 decision. seconds. Please begin to summarize. This development is not co compatible. I am asking you to uphold the, the deal that you made with the people who live in historic Richmond districts when we created historic district ordinances. We have been abiding by these ordinances and I ask that you insist that this developer abide by them as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mary Jane Massahoke, and I'm the director okay. of the Historic Richmond Foundation. And Mary Jane, if you just tell us you're opposed to it, that's fine because you guys are time us up. So, all of those, okay. All of those who are opposed to this, raise your hand. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out to raise your objections. I'm bringing this back to council at this point for discussion. Madam Chair, um, yeah. I want to go back and I want to make sure I understand. We're talking about voting on whether to deny uh, this application or accept this application Correct. Uh, based on mass. That's what I heard. Is that correct? Based on there are a couple of them. I believe that the attorney, um, I believe that the attorney for the developer would have some some other um, things to say too. But according to my read of this, Carr rejected this on Nancy. On Nancy, not on Okay, thank you. Mr. Connor? Uh, yeah. I'm going to support the appeal. Uh, first of all, I met with Delegate Quinn, and she informed me that she felt that these folks did everything they could to appease the folks of Carr. You know, they really went the distance. Uh, this massing came up after the third, third submission of a set of drawings. It makes it kind of tough. You know, people are trying to do, this, do their job. Uh, on three occasions, the staff didn't see massing as an incompatibility to the project. Just didn't see it. Um, I also understand that that they are doing 25 cases like this per month, and, and I've never seen one of these come before us like this. So I say they got a pretty good bad damage. Not doing bad at all, really. Um, <clears throat> the vote that they had was four to two. That's one vote away from a split decision. 
see. That gives me reasonable doubt. And, and for that, I think that there's, if we have an appeal process, I think it's a good one, and I think that there, there are times when we need to support it. And for that reason, I'm going to support this appeal. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Madam President, my heart goes out to the people that live in that neighborhood. And I am so sorry that all of you were not allowed to speak. Um, and also on your side, with the developers, it, it looks like we heard more from you all than we heard from the people that were for it. Because I'd like to know who lives near the project and who is living far away, especially when this lady comes before us tonight and tells us there's petitions, which, which I'll be honest, I have not seen the petitions. You know, she says that there, there were petitions, I have not seen them. So, I mean, it's kind of like, I wish we could have delayed this for another two weeks. I do not think that it would have been a problem to delay it since Betty, um, she's a council person. She's now, you know, I know that she's met with some people, but maybe if we could have all came together, you all could have came with her and sit down and spoke to her one-on-one -on -one if you had to, or just call her. Because I know her lines are open because she and I have communicated 11, 12 o'clock at night. Um, and let her see, you know, if you all could compromise with this, not with just the developers who says, um, you know, we have the right. Yes, you probably do have the right. But we have to remember the people that live there. They also have rights. So I, I wish we could do that. Because right now, at this time, um, since I've heard from most of you, and I apologize for grandson was in the hospital last week, and I know you all been calling, and I'm trying to meet with you all, and I just feel like I don't have all the information to really vote on this tonight. That's why I was asking for a delay, and I did not think that two weeks would have hurt for you all to come down, you all, for the people that are in support of it to be able to talk to us or to talk to her. And again, as you said, you know, you have the right, but they have rights too, because it is their neighborhood and their community that they have to live in. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, uh, uh, this is a tough one. Um, uh, there's no question that Carr does an excellent job. Uh, the mere fact that you get that many per month times that many months, and we only see one, two, or three of these a year, uh, suggests that they're doing the right thing. Typically, when it comes to us, it is hair-splitting close. It's hair-splitting close. I drove that, that property uh, the other day, and it, it, it's the most barren piece of land I've ever seen in my life. Uh, uh, that anybody wants to build on it um, is, is a tribute to the building. Uh, uh, it is so close to the bluff that you don't build a fence around that baby, you can fall over to fold the bottom. Uh, uh, but I also saw that alley. There's nothing pretty about that alley, and folks are complaining that long. We, 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 we're going to get our alley realigned. I don't know where the real complaint is with that. Uh, it ain't the prettiest alley I've ever seen. And so we've got a neighborhood that is historic, but it's really a district that's historic, and this sits at the very extreme end of it. If it were plopped down in the middle, I'd say it wasn't so close. But it's on the extreme end of that entire district. Uh, it comports to everything else except this dubious question of massing. Massing. How do you by right get to put that many units in one place and not have mass? That, that whole idea is incompatible. Unless you put them on the ground, well, who, who wants to live on the ground? Um, uh, otherwise, it obviously is not a bad project, it's not an ugly project, it's just mass. Uh, well, I've shown you the pictures of mass that have been exceptions. And, and while we do have code distinguished from guidelines, uh, uh, to be slaves to 
guidelines when you've got something this close. Uh, it seems to me that with all the work that's been going on over the last three years with this project, uh, I'm going to side with that very close, very close uh, uh, proposition that this applicant should get approved. The amount of money that's spent in permutation and permutation redesign uh, is enormous. And this is somebody else's property. Nobody else chose to develop it back there. Uh, 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 it's got a drapery of vines and trees that if it were open, it's a beautiful view shed that nobody talks about. As much as we talk about view shed. Well, it's beautiful at night. It's the prettiest thing in the day. Uh, and so, again, this is close, and I'm going to decide with you now. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Ms. Sparks? For the grounds I um, I agree with what's been said. This is a difficult decision, but this project has been going on since 2005, and I would like to ask the question, why did Madison come up just this past November uh, after they've had the work session and they had worked with CAR? Um, so it seems like you know, if this was if massing was something up front, then they could have dealt with it in a different light and been able to address that rather than to wait to the last minute. Uh, I too have seen the letter from Delegate McQuinn and she supports this project. Uh, so I'm going to have to defer to her. But this is a difficult decision because I know my uh, constituents are hurting. And when one hurt, we all hurt. Please remember that. Uh, I was hoping that we could do something different. When I first heard about this, I attended one of these sessions before I was appointed uh, to city council just to see what was going on. But when we have guidelines versus code and what have you, I'm hoping, Madam President, in the future that we can get together and see if we can work with the necessary groups so that we can resolve issues like this so it won't come up again in another district. We need to resolve these issues so that our people will feel much better about what's going on in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Spurs. Mr. Hill. Madam President, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, this is a, a difficult decision uh, on the merits of it. Uh, I think we can all have uh, issues of, of what we would like to see in our neighborhoods. Uh, I think that uh, the car uh, did have difficult decisions. Uh, however, uh, when you look at the code, uh, which is the law, and that we stood here in this chamber uh, two weeks ago, uh, with Squire, and on January the 1st, the other eight of us, we took an oath to uphold the law. And the law clearly states that the Commission of Architectural Review shall approve construction which is deemed compatible with the design, scale, materials, color, height, setback, and other pertinent features. There's no reference to massing in there. There is uh, reference to massing in the guidelines that were adopted. However, it says that these are uh, within the district and not within the block. And it also, it says it's within the block in another location. Uh, again, this is in the code, this is not in the guidelines. Uh, and it says that the Commission of Architectural Review may adopt architectural guidelines for any old and historic district to assist the public and the Commission in planning for and reviewing the exterior modifications within such district. The next sentence, should Excuse me, such guidelines shall be advisory only and shall not replace the review required by this division. That review being the, the items that I just cited. Design, scale, materials, color, height, setback. And so therefore, uh, the code, uh, just to cut to the chase here, trumps the guidelines. Clearly states the guidelines shall be advisory only and shall not replace the review required by this division. And so based on that, uh, uh, I'm going to have to uh, vote that Carr erred in its deliberative process uh, and put the guidelines on an even par uh, with the, the code, and that simply is, is unacceptable. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a, a tough decision, but a decision that based upon the law, uh, I have to go with, uh, uh, with overriding the decision. 
cars if cars are in I think the question tonight is, number one, is car in error? And number two, if so, should we reverse their decision? I don't think we can consider the green buildings, the zone, the density, good versus bad development, or anything else. We're simply asked to consider, did car make a mistake in their decision not to issue, or not to support this building? I'm not really swayed by the idea that because uh, the applicant spent a lot of money or had to go back and forth several times with new plans, that the applicant should get a pass on this just because she's been put through the ring. Uh, I'm also not convinced that just because she has the right to build 33 units, she ought to do that. There's no code section that says she has to build to the maximum. She was always entitled to build up to. She doesn't have to build the 33. Um, and while they certainly may build up to 33 units, if they wanted to reach the appropriate mass of their buildings, they could drop a few of the units to meet that mass. I'm not worried about zoning. They can make 18 little apartments in each one if they want, but they can always drop the number of units in order to meet the appropriate mass. That's neither here nor the other. What's the question is tonight is, did Carr make a mistake? I am not 100% convinced that they did. They applied the zoning rules, then they applied the overlay district building the story. Where I think if a mistake was made, it was based on shall versus should language. On page 41, someone brought it up earlier, the new structure should have the same number. I read that as mass. How tall the building is, how wide the building is. This is the mass of the building. Not how thick the density of it is, not how thick the uh, number of units are, but how tall, how wide. And uh, while it should, it doesn't have to. And for that reason, and with deference to Ms. Squire being that council district's representative, I will vote in uh, support of their. In support of. The project are in support of, of the development. Okay. A reverse of the companies. Mr. John, would you have a comment? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to start out. Um, I want to thank the CAR and also I want to thank the uh, community development uh, for the amount of time and effort they put into this. Uh, now, I realize that I think it was said earlier, I realize you see something like 25, 30 projects sometimes every time you get together and to have lunch or here occasionally. That's quite a batting average. I think Mr. Connor brought that up. Um, I think Mr. Hilbert's uh, rendition of the code versus guidelines is one from where I hang my hat. So I'm not going to repeat that again. Uh, I, when I look at it from a massive standpoint, uh, I think Carr was an error. On this as a guideline, I think the code trumps it, and that's my personal opinion. So because of that, I'm going to vote uh, to to sustain the appeal of the development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John um, I think we've had a good discussion here. I know that this has been a difficult decision for council as well as for CAR. Um, I have saw this development first, as uh, the developer stated in 2005. I know it has gone through many variations, but I, like Mr. Tyler, feel that Mr. Hilbert probably said it all, and I um, want to thank Carr for all their work with this developer, but I'm going to vote to reverse the decision also. And I'm perfect all the questions. Council's voting on item number 17, which is resolution 2009 R7, to reverse the decision of the Commission of Architectural Review. The voting on that paper, Mr. Tom? Uh, Mr. Samuels? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Vice President Robertson? Aye. Mr. Jewell? Aye. Ms. Squire? Aye. Ms. Trown? Staying. Mr. Tyler? Aye. Madam President? Aye. Ayes 8, noes 9, with 1 abstaining. That paper has been adopted. 
Grand Turk Reed and uh, will now need a motion to strike item number 16, which is resolution number 2009-R6. Mr. Jewell, would you make that motion? Move, Madam Clerk. Council's now voting on Councilman Jewell's motion to strike item number 16, resolution number 2009.